Our next speaker is Steve Saunders. Uh, Steve is an independent researcher from the Northeastern Arkansas area. He's a U.S. Navy veteran with his Bachelor's of Architecture from the University of Arkansas. He retired from a 30-year practice and returned to his roots in Northeast Arkansas. He interprets and researches local history at the Powhatan. Powhatan. Powhatan, thank you. Uh, historic State Park. During his research there, he discovered an interesting connection between the Powhatan area and St. Genevieve, and in particular, the Demun family. Steve's presentation today is titled, The Demun Family of St. Genevieve and New Bourbon. Please help me welcome Steve Saunders. Thank you. We're gonna divide this into three chapters today because the, the, the story of the Demuns is, is so diversified and, and large, they were only here uh, at St. Genesis for about seven years. Uh, so to, to really get a feel of these folks, we're gonna have to go back and talk about them before they got here, we'll talk about them while they were here, and then we're gonna talk about them a little bit after they left. Uh, so let's kind of start by introducing you to the family. Jacques is the father, and Madeline Le Milieu, uh, now I, you probably heard that name, Le Milieu. Uh, there was a Renee Le Milieu that was here, uh, married uh, Agate Beaulieu, am I saying these correctly? I think probably, probably not. Uh, but anyway, there's, there's a connection between her family and St. Genevieve. Uh, now, this is the list of kids here. This is Lewis and Cece, and August and Jules, you, you've heard a lot about Jules. He made the biggest impact on this region. And then Nicholas, we're not even going to mention Nicholas anymore because uh, he never got any further west than Baltimore and he died at sea. So, uh, so he's going to be out of the picture here. Most of our focus is going to be on Lewis, this guy, because he's the guy that's from my area. And that's why we're going to say he's so important. Uh, and, and also, uh, we're going to talk about this fellow, Julian Depes Gray. I'm not sure I'm saying that correctly, uh, but he married Cece. So uh, he is a part of this family as well. Uh, now they come from uh, what is now Haiti, it was San Domingo. And uh, if you were uh, born there and you were part of this minor nobility of France, you would be educated in France. Uh, so these, these folks were Creole, and, and Creole by definition there means that, that you are a French citizen, but you are born uh, in one of the colonies. Uh, so uh, as, as Creole there, you have the opportunity to go back to France and, and be educated there, and that's what happened to this cluster of, of kids. Uh, Marie Antoinette, we all know who she is, uh, queen of France, uh, wife of uh, Louis the 16th. She had an entourage of hundreds of people, and within that entourage, they included always about four or five pages. And these pages were typically uh, average around 14 years old. And at uh, at one time around 1778, one of those pages was a fellow named Le Chevalier de Mun. Now, we don't know that that's our Lewis de Mun, but there's some, there's some pretty good circumstantial evidence to make us think that it probably was, uh, and that when he went to France to be educated, uh, he was in Versailles. That's where he was, that's where he was getting his education as a page uh, to the Queen of France. Uh, his father also was Le Chevalier de Mun. That's Jacques that I'm talking about. Uh, so they, they both had that title, and uh, when, when the father was in France, he was the bodyguard of uh, King Louis the XV, uh, and so there's a connection between the royal family and the father, so it makes sense that, that, that he would have had those connections uh, for educating Louis when he went back. Uh, <laughs> He was, uh, he was so, I, I just want to say popular, let's, let's just say that 
but the name Le Chevalier, which means the knight. Uh, if you take it, that's what it means in England. It actually literally means horseman. Uh, but, but Le Chevalier is a name that stuck with him for the rest of his life. He would always sign his letters Louis de Mun, but his family always spoke of him as Le Chevalier. They never, ever called him Louis. So it was a term of endearment for his family to call him Le Chevalier. They never called father that. But, uh, you know, he may have been, and I'm being speculative now, but let's just say he might have been a favorite uh, page of the Queen, and that nickname probably stuck and went with for the rest of his life. Uh, this is his military record, uh, and he was a he was a Catholic, uh, he was a royalist, and when you know what hit the fan at the French Revolution, uh, they had to get out of town after after a few years. Uh, the uh, king and queen lost their heads, a lot of other people lost their heads, uh, so there were counter-revolutionary uh, armies that were formed, and Louis. Uh, participated in that. This is all in French. I don't read French, but people that can read this tell me that this little chunk right here talks about Lewis's activities at the Vendy. And, and the Vendy was a counter revolutionary uh, Catholic uh, royalist uprising in the western part of France uh, that happened in the late 17, uh, uh, well, on, in, the, in the mid 1790s. Uh, and, uh, and he participated in that. The latter part of this says that Lewis in January of 1800 uh, did a special project or a special mission. You now, whatever that means, I don't know. It sounds kind of like a spy mission of sorts, but, uh, and he did this for uh, Count uh, de Artois. Uh, he later becomes Charles X of France, uh, but uh, they are plausible. He's kind of like the, uh, you know how in England today we have, uh, what is it, William and Harry, they call them the, the heir and the spare. Well, <laughs> he's the spare. He, he, he's kind of playing that role. So, uh, uh, but he's royalty. And, and he organized a lot of this counter-revolutionary kind of activity uh, from, uh, uh, from Austria, Germany, and then eventually from England is where he was organizing some of So uh, Lewis has got quite, a, quite an interesting military record there. Now we're gonna talk about somebody else. We're gonna talk about Julian de Pestray, which was the brother-in-law. Uh, this, this is the guy that married the, the daughter, Cece. Uh, and uh, he was a French officer also. He had to get out of France as well. Uh, wound up going back to San Domingo, and the English decided uh, there's a great opportunity down here uh, because they got the slave revolt going on, and uh, they thought, well, we'll just go down and take over down there. And uh, this is uh, Toussaint. This is the, the guy that was uh, leading the slave revolt. Uh, when the English uh, came in, they had a number of generals, but at the very end, uh, they introduced this guy with General Thomas Maitland. And Maitland's job when he was there was to find an honorable way to get the heck out of there. Uh, and so uh, there wound up being three secret treaties uh, that arranged for the British uh, to leave. And involved in those uh, were some of the French officers that were fighting under the British. And Colonel Julian Depestray was one of those. It was a very well-trained and, and very capable uh, uh, French officer. So this guy's British, obviously. That's made, and this guy here looks like he's British too. And that guy, I think, is probably French. And I'm not saying that's that it's great, but I like to imagine that it's <laughs> Okay, who can identify these guys? <laughs> who says anybody? <laughs> <laughs> okay, President Obama, who's this? Supreme Court. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's Robert. He's the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Who's that? Uh, Benjamin Latrobe. That's right. That's Benjamin Henry Latrobe. And Latrobe is America's first architect. Now, there were a lot of people that, that would claim architect uh, status like 
probably the best well known is Thomas Jefferson, uh, but he had other jobs as well. And so architect was a uh, was kind of a sideline dreamer. It wasn't a sideline for this guy. He was educated in England. He was educated in Germany. Uh, and he was a professional architect. That's all he did. And when he came to the United States in the uh, 1790s, uh, he began to practice in, the, in Philadelphia, in the Pittsburgh area, but eventually by 1802, uh, he becomes the surveyor of public buildings for the United States. That basically means he's in charge of all of the federal construction that's going on in Washington in 1802. His draftsman, his chief draftsman and his best friend and the person that he relied on the most in his office was Louis de Munn. Uh, this is one of the projects they worked on. This is the U.S. Capitol. And here it is in 1800, it's under construction. This is before Latrobe came along and, and took over here. And, and by the time he got there, this thing was a mess. Uh, it, uh, it, it had a, a lot of parts that just structurally were going to fall in. Uh, it was dangerous, uh, <laughs> architecturally, it was kind of ugly. Uh, so he had a lot of work to do here. The point of the reason I'm showing you this is because Louis de Munn worked on this building. Yeah. Louis de Munn did drawings for this building and, and he went in here and helped do construction supervision for this building. Uh, Washington Navy Yard, same story. This is Latrobe's crown jewel. This is uh, th this is the, the, the what historians say is his best work. This is the Baltimore Cathedral. This wouldn't even have come about if it wasn't for Louis de Munn. Louis de Munn, big time Catholic. Uh, he wanted to find the, uh, the head of the Catholic Church in the United States at that time. Uh, he'd have to, to, to see uh, Bishop Carroll in Baltimore. And it was de Munn that made the connection between the bishop and Latrobe and, and uh, got this project started. But the, but the Munn only worked on this as long as it took to do the first set of drawings. So the construction, he didn't have anything to do with that. We're gonna change horses here again. Aaron Burr. Uh, Aaron Burr, Vice President of the United States under Thomas Jefferson. This is the guy that shot Mr. $10 Bill, Alexander Hamilton in the duel. <laughs> Uh, we're not we're, I don't want to get in the weeds on some of this stuff. I have a tendency to want to kind of go off and tell you some of these, some of these side stories, but you've probably already heard some of this. So uh, you, you know that, that Byrd got eliminated from uh, Jefferson's uh, uh, administration after the first, uh, after his first four years, and he got a new vice president, kick this guy out. Well, he tried to run for office in New York. He lost there. And he really didn't have too many places to go. Uh, so he started looking west. And he probably heard about the Burr Conspiracy, uh, where he was going to come down the Mississippi River. He was going to take over New Orleans. He got uh, uh, double-crossed by General Wilkinson. I'm assuming that we all kind of know this story, because I'm not going to go into it in any kind of depth. But the point is, is that he had uh, what most historians refer to as his chief of staff, uh, which was Colonel Julian Depis Dray, which, was, which is the guy that was married to Cece, you know, the brother-in-law of, of, of Lewis. Uh, and uh, I think that maybe that's the wrong thing to, to call him. He was really more like a military advisor uh, to Burr. Uh, even, even though it has sort of stuck because these historians kept calling him chief of staff, but I don't find anything that, that really refers to him in those earliest records as chief of staff. Uh, but there's no question that uh, that Estray was deeply involved in, in what we now call the Burr conspiracy, as was Lewis. Uh, at the time that all this came down, Lewis was down in New Orleans. He'd been sent down there by the, the Secretary of the Treasury to to, uh, uh, to, to do a survey of the coast. Uh, and he was doing this under the, the guidance of Latrobe. And Latrobe was kind of up to it to his, to his ears, too, even though he kind of snuck out a long story. We're not really going to go into any, any more of that. But they were really heavily involved in the, in the Burr conspiracy. 
when the, when the Burr trial for, for treason was over and he was acquitted, uh, everybody kind of scattered a little bit. And the DeBunn family, the, at least the boys, uh, decided we're going to go to Cuba because Jules had already been down here since 1803. So they did have some property down here uh, in, at Matanzas, just east of, of Havana. And they got there in 1808. And uh, the first thing they did was swear allegiance to the king of Spain. And about two weeks later, the king of Spain changed. Napoleon put his brother on the throne in Spain, and all of a sudden, this is not where the demands want to be. <laughs> so they pick back up, and they go back up uh, to the United States. Uh, but there's kind of a couple of mystery years here from about... From 1808 up to 1810, uh, I have this sort of hypothetical uh, theory, a lot of speculation. Uh, I'm not even going to discuss it publicly today. I'd be happy to discuss it with anybody later on if you want to about what was happening during these two years. Uh, and it's, it's rather it's rather strange and, and, and bizarre, but it's, it's more or less a continuation of the Burr conspiracy. Uh, and that's an ongoing research, uh, so whatever, if, if you do want to ask me about that later, it's speculation. Uh, but we don't really uh, find them popping back up sort of publicly until about 1810. Uh, Audubon, when he was uh, headed for St. Genevieve, uh, Audubon uh, had to stop at a place called Cash Creek. It's about six miles before you get to the Mississippi to the Ohio. Uh, and the Mississippi was full of ice at the time. This is in December of, of 1810, about Christmas time. And they couldn't go up to Mississippi. Uh, so they had to stop there, and he met this Count de Mun that was, uh, well, several different accounts, but the one that I prefer to, to believe is that Audubon was on a flat boat and Demun was on a keel boat. And you hear it the other way around, and you hear that they're both on keel boats. And, uh, anyway, we'll, we'll accept the one where Audubon's here, the Mun's there. Uh, and uh, they, they stayed together for several days while they were waiting for that ice to kind of clear up, so they got to know each other. Uh, Audubon didn't write about this until 18 years later. So we were referring to some 18-year-old notes when he did. And there's some kind of goofy uh, inconsistencies in, in some of the reports. Uh, but what this does tell us is that the DeMunns are headed for St. Genevieve in 1810. Uh, these, these two portraits, they, these are on ivory. They're watercolors. They're about two inches tall. They're at Mohist, and uh, they are uh, just labeled as Mr. DeMunn. So we don't know which Mr. DeMunn these guys are. We know they're two different Mr. DeMunn obviously. Uh, we do know that Jules was said in 1812 when, when he married uh, Charles Gratio. Okay, when he married, when, when, when Jules married uh, his daughter, uh, they were said to be the most handsome, most beautiful couple in St. Louis. And that's a pretty handsome guy. There, so, so I like to think that's Jules. <laughs> I like to think this is Lewis. <laughs> a more military looking outfit that he's wearing there. This is probably more 1800-ish. This is probably a little later than that. Uh, but we really don't know who these guys are. That might even be Devin Straight for all I know. But, but anyway, these came down through the family. Uh, there's a connection between uh, Bold Duke. Uh, family uh, and this is the this is the Bold Duke house. You're all probably familiar with this. This is Lady Milieu's house. This wasn't built till 1820, so we know it wasn't here uh, at the time that, that the, the Munns were here because they're going to be gone by 1817. Uh, but uh, uh, Renee Lady Milieu married uh, the daughter of, of Bold Duke. Uh, in 1815, that was at the time that the Demuns were here. So in my head, I'm trying to say what is uh, ground zero for the Demuns in St. Genevieve. 
this is the closest I can come. I, I don't know that that's the case, but I know that they knew these folks and they knew them well because they had the family connections there. The front, where the photographer's standing here, a couple of blocks back behind me, there's a house. I don't know what it's called now, but it's MacArthur. It's the John of the Red Walker. Okay. But, and, and it's it's a couple of blocks back there. It's going to come up here in a little bit. We'll, we'll check about that. Uh, but it's not very far back behind me. And there is, that street there is uh, Market Street. This is down below us. Now we're going into my stomping ground. Uh, this is down near Pocahontas, Arkansas. But the Munn brothers really diversified. They, they were up in St. Louis. They went down south. They were trying to get involved with fur trading companies. Uh, uh, any any kind of uh, natural resources they could uh, uh, they could they could go gather up. They were they were into that kind of stuff. That's the way they were going to uh, to make their living. And they went down to uh, near Pocahontas, what is now Pocahontas, Arkansas, uh, on the Black River, and they built a, a mill uh, down there called uh, the Mun Mill. They left St. Genevieve in uh, late in in 1812, there's a letter at Mo that uh, where they, they write to Jules up in uh, St. Louis and they say, we're, we're leaving with a couple of lighters and we've got them loaded up with, with, uh, with planks uh, and you need to get one more and come down to St. Jen and then pick up some planks here uh, and, then, and then come on with us. They don't say where they're going, but obviously this is where they're going. So they have to go down the Mississippi River and then they have to come up the White River and then turn up the Black River uh, until they get to, to this point right here. Uh, because in 1813 they built this mill. And there weren't very many families down here on the Black River, but uh, some of those names are names that you would recognize from New Bourbon, they are names that you would recognize from St. Genevieve or Janine. I can we call them Janice, where I come from. Uh, and, uh, uh, there was a uh, Lemieux uh, uh, face, which we call the Bass, down there. Uh, so the, a number of families that had come from Kaskaskia, St. Genevieve, and Bourbon, uh, uh, Lacombe uh, was down there with, with a new bourbon name, uh, uh, Rivet. Uh, anyway, anyway there, there were a number of folks that had already gone down and started to populate this area today. Uh, all that's left today are these dam members <coughs> in the creek. You can see them running all through that. They went all the way across the creek. This is an undisturbed archaeological site uh, that the Arkansas Archaeological Survey is aware of, and hopefully they'll get in there before looters find it and, and start going out there and digging the place up. Uh, but it's a very important archaeological site in Arkansas. Uh, 1815, the DeMunds had already been down there for two years. And that's when Missouri uh, Territory uh, founded Lawrence County. Lawrence County was founded out of uh, a New Madrid County. And it's a large chunk of land, as you can see. Here's the food deal right here. And there's there's the, the separation between uh, the two states today, uh, but it's this large chunk of land right here. It's about half the size of Tennessee today. Uh, William Clark was governor of Missouri Territory at the time, and uh, he appointed Lewis de Munn uh, to be the county clerk of Lawrence County and the lieutenant commandant of the militia in Lawrence County, and he also appointed him to be president of a commission to locate uh, the jail and the and the courthouse because there were no towns in this area at that time. If, you, if it was a settlement, it was just one or two houses at the most. Uh, and so the, I'd love to tell you this story, but it's a whole nother <laughs> lecture. Uh, but they eventually chose Davidsonville. It's right there on the Black River uh, where the 11 Point River and the Spring River uh, come together, uh, it's a wonderful location, uh, and uh, uh, 
again, it's a it's a long story. We ain't going there today. <laughs> Steve, where is Pocahontas on that map? Okay. Pocahontas is right there. So the Mun Mill is right there. Just and, above and, and, and it. And it's about oh ten miles as the crow flies <laughs> uh, below. Uh, and uh, well, you almost got me in the weeds there. I was about to, have, oh. I was about to get out there. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, yeah, it was really close, really close. So yeah, they, but their mill was right there. 1816, the next year, was a really bad year for the Demun. Uh, this is the journal of Jules Demun. Jules. Uh, as, we, as we said before, he had married in 1812, and he married into some elite St. Louis families. And uh, he had become a business partner with A.P. Choteau. I'm saying that one right? Choteau? Choteau. Uh, and they headed out west uh, on a fur gathering mission fur hunting mission, and uh, wound up down in Santa Fe, and, and they got themselves to home prison, Spanish prison. So uh, th this is at Mogis. This is a this is the journal itself, and it's been translated, uh, and you can you can find copies of that translation if you if you're really interested. It doesn't really talk about the time he's in jail or anything. It talks about the time they were going out there. Uh, but uh, but like I say, bad year. Jules is kind of out of the picture now because he's in prison. Uh, this is uh, the house that we were talking about just a moment ago. This is where John MacArthur, and it says William there, if I'm not mistaken. John MacArthur's house. Uh, you, it's just a few miles over here. You can go, go see it today if you want to. Uh, but to walk from here, MacArthur has to go pretty close to where the, uh, you know, Bo Duke house was. Uh, MacArthur and August the Munn were both running for the legislature of Missouri Territory in 1816. And as politicians will do today, they said a lot of nasty things about each other. <laughs> Jules said that MacArthur uh, had uh, been involved in counterfeiting money. And uh, then uh, MacArthur challenged him, challenged Jules, or not Jules, but, uh, but August to a duel. And uh, August said, well, you're not gentlemanly enough to, for me to go to a duel with you. <laughs> uh, but that set up a situation where if they crossed paths, uh, it was, it was going to happen. And uh, if August the 28th, 1816, <coughs> excuse me, apparently uh, uh, MacArthur had left his house and was walking up Market Street towards the old brick, which at that time was serving as the courthouse on that day. The court was active on that particular day. And uh, MacArthur and his brother-in-law, Dr. Lewis Lynn, uh, came up to, to this area right in front of the old brick, and about uh, 80 to 100 yards behind them, here come the two the Munn brothers. Uh, and there were several witnesses to this, so there are depositions for how this all came down, but uh, to kind of combine those depositions, uh, they met here in front of the old brick. Uh, they started pulling out their cudgels, and then they started pulling out their pistols. Uh, one says that Demun shot first, and somebody else says that MacArthur shot first, uh, but but Demun was hit, August Demun. And uh, they, he, he then followed MacArthur into the old brick, and uh, MacArthur came out, and the Munn did not. So, so the Munn died in the old brick. Uh, uh, this is August the Munn's burial record. This is in the uh, the Catholic Cemetery burial record, and uh, Bob tells me that this is an unusually large record. Uh, for those, most of the time it just says such and such died on such and such a day was buried. Uh, this is this, this is kind of like a, an obituary where they, they put in a lot of information about him here. Uh, 
Uh, there's Lewis's signature right there. Uh, there is the mother's signature, that me the viewer of the month. And, uh, and then here's all this, the present Dickens Gray crowd right here. Uh, daughters and, and, uh, and son. It looks like Edmund signed his own, but it looks like the mother who the month Dickens Gray, she signed for the, for the daughters here. But uh, uh, one thing that's, that's absent from here is Julian's signature. The father, he's not here. He's not here because he's sick. I don't know what kind of sickness it was, but he's, he's ill at this time. Notice that's page 105. This page 106. And this is doing the trade burial record. Uh, just right beside it again, it's huge uh, compared to the other entries uh, that you find. Uh, Lewis is not here anymore. He's gone off somewhere. Uh, and, uh, and then you see the, uh, some other uh, signatures here, but again, this is kind of an obituary of Julian. So, okay, so we've lost Jules. He's in prison. Uh, Debbie Spray has died. August has died. Again, bad year for these guys. <laughs> so, they leave St. Genevieve in 1817, and they go over to the Baltimore area for a couple of years, and by 1819, then, the whole family uh, has moved down uh, back to Cuba, with the exception of uh, Lewis. And Lewis was requested by this guy, Baron Hyde de Newville, who had just become the uh, minister uh, from France to the United States uh, when, the, uh, when, when the revolution was over with, and when Napoleon was over with, and the, the Bourbon family went back in uh, to France. This is the guy that they sent over here as the ambassador uh, from France. And he knows the demands, and he, uh, uh, he writes to, to Lewis and says, go out there to Santa Fe, uh, reconnoiter that area, and then write a, an anonymous uh, description of just how bad the Spanish forces are out there. Their objective is that, that, that they want to uh, start a negotiation between the United States and Spain to actually determine finally a boundary between the, the two uh, because uh, otherwise there's going to be a fight and there's no interest uh, to, to France in that happening and so that's why uh, Baron Hyde de Deauville was involved in that. So who does he choose to do that? He sends Louis the Mud out here to Santa Fe and then he writes that report, brings it back up here to Washington and they leak it to uh, Louis Onus, who is the ambassador uh, from Spain, he says, oh, he starts pulling his hair out and he says, you know, we're in a lot of trouble here. We don't, we don't have very good defenses out here and we don't really know where that line is. And it finally kickstarts the negotiation between uh, Adams is uh, John Quincy Adams, who was Secretary of State at the time. It kind of kickstarts this negotiation. And just to make a long story short, this, this is, uh, the treaty that, it, that sometimes is called the Inter uh, Transcontinental uh, Treaty because it established that the United States went all the way to the West Coast, right up here around Oregon and Washington, but it's also how it picked up Florida. And Baron Hyde the New Bill was the middleman. Think of Jimmy Carter working between Menachem Begin and Sadat, okay? <laughs> That's the kind of role that that the new bill was played here. Uh, but his right hand man, the, uh, who was the uh, Secretary of Legation for the French Embassy was Louis de Mun. And so Louis de Mun was the guy that was physically taking all these, these uh, reports and, the, and, and this back and forth and, and uh, getting somebody's response. He was the one that was listening to them saying, I don't think that's gonna wash. And, then, and so that, but it was Lewis that was doing all the legwork. Uh, and when the treaty was finally established, it was Lewis that took it to France and to England uh, and showed it to the authorities there. So 
Lewis DeMunn played a really big role in the Adams Cross <coughs> Treaty, uh, uh, which, as I say, is how we picked up Florida and, and a big chunk out here. It's also the, the, the thing that started this thing down here with, with Texas. And we all know who that, how that ended <laughs> a, a few years later. But we left Texas with, with Spain. And uh, in a few years, uh, Lewis left uh, Baron Heisenhut, uh, and he went to the rest of the family in uh, Cuba, and he spent the rest of his life there uh, on a coffee plantation. Uh, I can place him there in 1840 with 60 slaves. Uh, and then in 1845, there's a letter from him back to Jules, who has now moved back to St. Louis. Uh, and in that letter, his, his well, I'm sorry, it's not the Jules, it's the Jules' wife, because Jules died in 43. Uh, but, the, but the Jules' wife in, in St. Louis in 45, and the handwriting is very shaky. And he mentions that he's going to follow Jules pretty soon. Uh, so I don't know when he died, but I know he was still alive in 1845 in Cuba on the coffee plantation. Uh, so, that, again, just to review where we were, that the, the demands weren't in St. Genevieve very long, only about seven years, but they were an extraordinary family. Uh, and so uh, I, I hope that uh, kind of gives you an insight about, the, about those folks. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>
Here, one may walk up to the brick wall house and place a hand on the upright post that form both the foundation and the wall. These are the same posts that were here two centuries ago. The town hasn't been restored, I obviously know this was 1967, and it hasn't been moved. And when I found that, when I started my research last semester, you know, that's something that really kind of struck me, was, you know, in this town, you know, we have very old historic buildings and structures that, you know, have been here, you know, for several centuries. And, you know, you, and where I grew up, and when I've been to other historical towns, you, you, some, you some, sometimes don't see that. And, you know, and so, you know, my presentation today will be about basically how during the 19, you know, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, you know, through, through the efforts of people in the community and also influential people outside of the community who came in like Charles E. Peterson and um, Charles Ravensway, how they together basically helped, you know, identify and produce, you know, what we have, what it is today, the historical St. Genevieve, which has things like this conference. And so, you know, my presentation is going to be about, you know, what occurred, you know, the major highlights from the 1930s, mainly, also in the 40s and 50s, which led to, by the 1960s, and obviously beyond what we are, you know, today, you know, this place that has historical buildings and records. No, this way. All right. Prior to prior to the nineteen thirties, um, you know, for for the nineteen thirties, okay, in, in terms of the research that I uncovered, you know, a couple of things stand out. You know, first of all, the, the Saint Genevieve did seek out ways to attract tourists to the town, okay, and you know. In terms of the earliest that I uncovered, you know, from the secondary and primary sources, um, in 1885 there was a there was a one 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 day event, just a celebration to you know celebrate the move from the old town to the new town. Rain came in that day and kind of you know sub, kind of hampered the celebration. I believe it was in July, and then we get to the 20th century, especially the early 20th century. The town is trying to find ways to Get people to come and visit, and you know, with reference what Dr. Nickel talked about earlier, um, you know, and, you know, what the ideas there in terms of advertising the, the scenic beauty of this community and county to building campsites for motors for you know as the automobile is moving in and developing, you know, in, in the early 20th century and in, in the 1930s, and we look at. We, when you look at basically, you know, part of the 1930s, one thing that seems to be going on is this, is, you know, the residents who lived here and, you know, realized that, you know, St. Genevieve, you know, it, it, it's, it's old, it had, you know, you know, there's very important buildings here, but they were really trying, it was a hard thing to try to find out how do we market people to come into this town, okay? You know, how do we get people to come here to visit, okay? Um, so, you know, in terms of, and let me read this one example first, for example, from the 1928 Fair Club. Um, this is from Ed Torrey. In a town such as ours, as close as it is to, to the city of St. Louis of one million persons, its old landmarks and <coughs> should have a share of the tourist trade every summer. You know, the, the people in the community knew that, you know, there was, historical significance in this town. And, but, so they knew there's historical significance, but the key was, was how do you get people to, to people to come here, okay? Um, you know, at the time, as most of us in here know, the, you know, m most of the historic homes today were still private residents. Mm -hmm. And so the key was, was, you know, how do you get people to come here prior to the 1930s? And then second, you know, how do you attract people from St. Louis and also down south? As Dr. Nichol described in his last lecture, the roads weren't quite developed, you know, as obviously they would be as time would move on. And so the biggest problem really is they know they have historic buildings here, but there really is, from, from all the accounts that I've read, newspaper, et cetera, kind of a lack of recognition of 
St. Jude's, French colonial past, and what makes the architecture and some of these structures special? All right, 1930s is, is really the, the, the critical decade. That is the decade where you really have three things going on, which I'll talk about in, in, most, in great detail, which will take up most of the presentation. Um, this one right here, the artist colony, okay, you know, this one, you know, in terms of this, um, in 1932, you started, to, you started to see artists, you know, coming from places like Massachusetts to St. Genevieve, attracted by the scenic beauty, painting rural, you know, this type, this type of regional art, which many of us are aware of. And then, of course, the Shaw House became a very important place to your left there, right by the, you know, right by the post office, a place that, you know, during these years, 1932 and, you know, ending in 1941, dying, slowing down definitely in the late 30s, you, you saw, you know, you saw some artists coming into town. Now, in terms of the overall effect of tourism, in terms of St. Genevieve, that is difficult to determine, but one thing that does appear, and the reason why I included it in my presentation was, you started to see publicity in the St. Louis area for for you know some of from for some of the art shows and summer school happened. Now, in terms of you know being a, being a critical event compared to the two other events of the 30s, okay, and based off my research, um, not not as significant, okay, but you know you start to see, especially based off the post dispatch, okay, there's awareness of something that's happening in St. Jude. Okay, there's an interest, you know. Thomas Hart Benton came here, came here a couple of summers and did paint. And you know, one of the problems with the art school that I found, and, and it's been mentioned in several secondary sources, is you know they're, they're still looking in terms of evidence, in terms of you know what were some of the seats to get people here. But you know, it started in 1932 and then really slowing down by the late 30s, like 1941. Okay, we did have the artist colony that that was here in present in town. And why I brought it in, once again, is because you see publicity in the post dispatch. Why there wasn't as much coverage in the St. Genevieve, Fair Play, or Herald, I'm, I'm not sure, but this was present in town. The, 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 in the 1930s, two, real, two really critical things are going on. Number one, the local community is starting to prepare for the 1935 bicentennial celebration. Okay. Second thing is you start to see, as we get into later, the, the arrival of people such as Charles Peterson to the town to start to look at the historical architecture. Brief background on the on on the preparation for the bicentennial. The first public meeting for the bicentennial was held January 29, 1933. Um, Basically, at the time, the Chamber of Commerce this, you know, decided that 1935, they wanted to have a celebration to honor as they saw it. I'm not sure if Dr. Eckenberg is in here. <laughs> as what they saw at the time. I want to make sure to say that. <laughs> so, in terms of the founding year of the town, they saw you know, 1735 as the founding date of the town. And so in January, of that year, they had the first public meeting, and you know, at that at that meeting, they decided that they were going to plan and coordinate a celebration to be done in two years. Now, they, the, the the local chamber in town recruited the governor, Mr. Guy B. Park. This gentleman, you know, smiling with the camera right there, smiling with the program right there. Okay. Um, the, what what the goal was with the bicentennial was was this, number one, start planning two years ahead, and and what they wanted was, was they wanted to get a committee together that would be bipartisan, that means half Democrat, half Republican, okay? So neither party could claim that they were the ones who, you know, did all the work, you know, politics, okay? And, and when they made the, com the committee up here, here um, they, they appointed the governor as an honorary chairman 
and it was his job to basically fund what became known as the, the Bicentennial Commission. And, and the governor, out of this group of, of distinguished businessmen and influential community leaders in, in the community, he went ahead and selected three men to run and head the commission. Over here you have Herbert Fowler, who, in, who was the chief of the chairman. Okay. Um, here. Rozier, I'm trying to make his first name. Um, Francis J. Rozier was named Secretary Treasurer. He is in the middle. And then the last one, the last one, John W. Swint, he would be, he would serve as basically secretary. And when you look at this group, they they would they operated independent of the, of the St. Jimmy Chamber of Commerce who, you know, prior to the 30s had been trying to find ways to promote the town and tourism, and this would be focused only on one thing, preparing for the 1935 bicentennial. Um, local representatives were contacted and, and that year, 1933, and they were able to push through with, I think, remarkable speed. They were able to get the North Missouri State Legislature to basically approve giving St. Genevieve budget for that year of $5,000. Now, when you look at that time, what's going on in 1933? The Great, the Great Depression. You know, I find that remarkable in that they were, the legislature was willing to give that much money they, right away, and then an additional $5,000 would be given during the year of the bicentennial. So the Missouri State Legislature, with you know, remarkable, I think remarkable speed, was able to get a budget of a what became ten thousand dollars to fund the bicentennial, and this all occurred within the winter and fall um, of 1933. Okay. And eventually, from this from this group of individuals, which is in the pageant pamphlet picture, and it's in the library again, you can find it many places. These out of this group, they would eventually divide up the town into 14 different subcommittees would handle things from parking to planning what later became the centerpiece of the bicentennial, the historical pageant, which would eventually be more, more on that to come. So you have the beginnings of a, a widespread community events, the 1935 bicentennial. The same year, 1933, you have something developing in California. Charles E. Peterson, originally from Minnesota, and in 1933 was a young um, you know, architect and college educated you know, scholar who was working for the National Park Service. And in 1933, um, November of that year, he wrote a proposal to the Secretary of, of the Interior, Harold Ikes, basically asking permission to, you know, for funding of about a little, a little under half a million dollars half a million dollars, five hundred thousand dollars, and his goal was was Peterson saw a vision of let's take out employed architects and surveyors and let's have them basically let's employ them and let's have them travel around the country and photograph and document and survey buildings and architecture around the country, American history. Nothing of this national wide spread had been done like this. His proposal was sent in November of 1933, around November 17th. Two days later, the Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ikes, okayed the proposal. Once again, you know, Great Depression, half a million dollars roughly, and what became known as the American Historical Building Survey, HABS, was born. And so, you know, immediately, Peterson and other individuals individuals across the country started to descend upon cities and towns, photographing, document, trying to figure out the significance of American architecture. And so, starting in 1933 and for the rest of the 30s, 30s until, you know, the outset of World War II, you had teams of surveyors and photographers who descended upon St. Jim. Okay. Here is a, here is a CAPS team in, you know, research. And they go into a community, private residence, take photographs, try to look for, you know, 
of what type of material, when the structure, how old the structure was. And the one thing they did find in St. Jim that as many of us, as many of you in here know, is that, that you know the records they had to do a little digging. But you have, you know, for really for one of the first times, you know, experts come <coughs> and basically document the buildings and which continues to be here, for example, for that you can find this today online of the Gabor Bauhaus. And you know, in terms of photographs and um, from from the thirties, eighties when they did it again, you know, fascinating material. One key thing that came out of this has so you got the bicentennial, you got have serving is here's a here's a photograph of the Amaral House taken in 1936. Okay, right here. Okay. So you know, they're going around town and you know they're documenting extensively. One key thing that, that's coming out of this as well is you have a young you have a young graduate student at Washington University who during the summertime they in the 30s, named Charles Lavensway, he, he assisted the Habs um, teams as well. In fact, the group he worked with one summer was, I believe, called the Piche Brothers. I think so if I mispronounced that. And, you know, he in the spare, in the summertime, would go and document and help these teams to look at historic buildings. That's going to be critical later on because, as we will see, he plays a big part in, in future structures such as the Bolduc House. Okay. One, one note while all this is going on, and in terms of this, in terms of the structures, most of them were private residents um, at, you know, during the 1930s. And one noteworthy, I think, restoration at the time it, that occurred in 1930 was the example of the Kibor Valley House. It was, per, it was purchased by a jewel by Jules in Amarillo Valley in 1931 at a price of you know, $4,500. And when you look at you know, what the valleys did, you know, basically they went in, they restored the home, and obviously made it a private home. But it's, you really see now you know, you know, one of the first attempts of people saying, okay, we've got these, these historic buildings, and you know, the Valley family was one of the first Restorations later on, Ravensway, you know, commenting in in collecting in a document I found in 1970s said the Moore Valley House was a major step in you know what happened to you know, later homes in the years to come. Of course, as everyone knows, the Valley House was its non trust thing. By the 1935 bicentennial, okay, you know, the Valley House and several other homes would be centerpieces that would be featured prominently in editions of the Fair Play and St. Jim here. Back to the Bicentennial. By 1934, things are picking up. This, the committee has got its, is, is, has got its funding, eight five thousand dollars is waiting as soon as 1935 turns. And one of the key things with the Bicentennial was, was they wanted to plan, you know, a, a four-day historical pageant. And you know, here's the copy of the program here. And the, the, Roman, the Roman, the Catholic Church was was recruited and involved in it because at the time, um, this man, J. B. Plasma, he had been involved in doing historical pageants in other in other communities around the area prior to that. And the key, what, what they wanted to do was was to celebrate Saint Genevieve as the Mother of the West and, and to honor its history. Now, going back to prior to the 1930s. How do we market this town? Now we're starting to see, for the bicentennial, obviously, you know, it's kind of thing, let's try to market this, you know, you know, historical heritage. And in terms of, you know, the cast, they would recruit eventually a cast, as many of you probably, probably know, a cast of 1,200 people will be recruited from this community. Um, the town of St. Jimmy, I'm not, I know today it's like 4,700. I remember looking at some document, I think in 1941, it was like just a little, just, a, just right around 4,000, not counting the county, obviously. That's a lot of people from a very, very small county where you know, going back to what Dr. Nickel talked about, it's very tough to travel roads around it. So a cast of 2,000 
I'm sorry, 1,200 people were recruited in terms of passion. Four day events, which involve singing, dancing, you know, acting. One scene, they're going to flood a man made island to the great 18, 1785 flood. Okay, we'll get more on the construction later. But you know, one thing that, that has emerged from that is in about 1934 is things were going well, but they soon found that you know, the all male committees were having a hard time with the songs and dances. <laughs> <laughs> and so, in the fall of 1934, um, they actually got together a women's auxiliary committee, who, and their job was to basically teach the people in, in the teach the people in the pageant the proper dances and songs. So I guess, you know, gentlemen, they just were not getting the job done for the what they wanted. Okay? And so, you know, you know, prior to that you had a lot of male involvement. Now women are are, are getting involved in terms of pageant. Another buildup in terms of the same time is you know some of the money is going to start to build what we see today, you know, the historical museum, you know, to house, you know, you know, memorabilia, to house things that really celebrates, you know, you know, the, you know, the historic things of St. Jim. So, you know, 30, 34, the, the, the preparations are there, and in the Fair Play and St. Jim Herald, you can definitely see that the bill for the bicentennial is here. The town is really, you know, getting behind this. Some people are nervous, okay? But there's a big, huge effort by it. And once again, I'll go back to it. This is the Great Depression, at a time where money is scarce, and you see this massive, you know, involvement for town size. <coughs> Marketing becomes a big thing leading up to bicentennial, and um, you know, with the pageant being prepared um, and the museum being um, work beyond construction. The, the, the town really sought to try to market this this bicentennial, 35 bicentennial. Here is here is you know in the fair play just some of the build up to that. There is the commission and the governor, the I showed you earlier. Here is some of the homes, some of the homes that you see. You know you start to see that you know in in, in articles which you didn't see you know, prior in the 1920s and. And in terms of literature, I want to read you the following quote in terms of, and this came from a brochure that was presented in St. Louis around 1954 by the Women's Club of St. Genevieve. Um, and this, I'm glad to update, they gave a presentation about how they did the bicentennial. And here's what she had to say about the marketing for the bicentennial. Literature for repent was sent to every county in the state of Missouri and Eastern Illinois to aid in advertising. Huge posters, car stickers, 50,000 colorful folders were circulated. Two sets of medallions commemorating the St. Jimmy's Bicentennial were sold as souvenirs. Some of these were sent to the, to the president, senators, congressmen, and prominent speakers from St. Louis added radio publicity. So you have a big marketing campaign to try to promote the Bicentennial. Privately, there would be additional $5,000 that would be raised for the bicentennial, so the sources that I looked at, newspaper and everything found, the total budget in for the whole thing ended up being around fifteen thousand dollars, just trying to promote with the state funding and then product. Um, the state le state representatives contacted Franklin Roosevelt, the president at the time, obviously, and asked him to come and talk at the bicentennial. He declined. But later, he would give a special speech on a $400 special line telephone on the day of the bicentennial of the camera. So even though the President of the United States was involved and did give a speech via telephone, $400, okay, in the speech. Harry Truman would, would be at the bicentennial celebration as well. And Governor Park, being one of the men who oversaw the commission is as well, Governor Park, he would be present during this, this celebration as well. So you have a very, you know, well done marketing campaign. Okay. One additional marketing tool um, was before the bicentennial began, and they set the dates for the 19th, the 18th, 19th, I'm sorry, the 19th, 20th, 21st, and 22nd. Okay. On the 18th, they were able to get the American annual state meeting of the American Legion 
to have their meeting and convention in St. Genevieve. So once the convention's over, okay, then you have the bicentennial celebration. Okay. Pretty, I think that's a very you know, shrewd marketing move, especially when you want to get people to They're going to come here for the meeting. Well, there's a four-day celebration after that. So, 1935, the funding came in, and you know, things things were playing in place. And 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 the, so the bicentennial opens on August 19, 1935, and the mayor, Mayor Henry J. Pinkwad, gave the following speech, and I think you know really shows you know development of where the town is going in terms of trying to think about how to attract people to the town. Here's what he said. We invite you to turn away from the monotony of everyday life to make this visit in the nature of pilgrimage, in the nature of pilgrimage, a shrine of history. See the portrayal of the beautiful history of our pioneer forefathers as rich old tapestries with all its glory color, scenes woven in the cloth of time, made bit by bit by the slow passage of two centuries, made up with all the clean, bright colors of their simple joys, shot through the golden light of the homestead heat. What is what is government? What is the mayor you know, talking about? Come to St. Jim to see its historical past. See the, the heritage of St. Genevieve, going back to you know prior. How do we get people into this community? Well, let's promote our historical past, which includes the, the French colonial past. Okay, and you know right from there, okay, that's what they were going to do in the Bison, during the bicentennial celebration. Um, the celebration itself, you know, as I said, lasted four days. Um, you had you had parades every day. People went to the historical museum. Okay, um, there was you know speeches in the afternoon, and in the evening you had you know the pageant you know held at a, a built in amphitheater. Now, on the, where they held the pageants, where they held the pageants. Um, there's a monument there today, but what they did was out by Valley Springs, that direction over there, they took a natural stream, they they dammed it, and they basically built nat a, a natural amphitheater, had a man-made island so they could flood, so they could flood it, and the scene was to hold 15,000 people. Okay, you know, so 15,000 people. Um, but lights were lights were brought in. Up to when they you had the stage was three levels. Okay, which I'm not, you know, some of us have seen the, you know, the picture. I think the picture, there's a picture, I think, the store because it shows the whole cast together. Okay. And um, also, you had a telephone, telephone system to control the directors. Group. So the pageant occurred um, every every night, and it was basically the history of St. Jim from, you know, from, 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 from the ancient discovery up to the past. The themes every day was St. Jimmy Day was the day, first day, St. Louis Day, try to attract those, you know, those people up north. You had Missouri Day, and the last day was National Day. And, um, and so every night the pageant kept building up. The grand finale, which was, you know, when you had, on the last night, we had you know, all the entire cast, 1,200 of them, all up there singing and doing kind of a final hurrah. And they had varied cast members from, from really young to old. Costumes were made, were, were, were made, obviously. It was a good <coughs> production. So in terms of you know, the, the final numbers here, okay, um, they raised $15,000 for the, for the four-day event. The state obviously gave $10,000, $5,000, four private relays. Um, the museum cost, you know, $4,500. The, according to the Carol and St. Jim Fair Play, around 2,000 people visited the museum every day during the bicentennial. The pageant budget um, was costumes and everything else was um, eight, was this amount right here, eighteen thousand seven hundred ninety-four dollars and thirty-six cents. The price per admission was a dollar thirty, and um, they had a, they had a special train coming from St. Louis. So you can bring people via train, you know, you know, they had to build, you know, increased area for parking. So they really wanted to try to you know get people here for the pageant. The pageant, you know, um, did did end up making twenty-one thousand one hundred and forty-four dollars and ten cents. So there so there was a profit with the 
with the pageant itself of that amount. Average crowd estimate now, initially they were hoping for, you know, more than 20,000, so some of the papers were kind of disappointed, but they still in the four days averaged 10 to 20,000 people, you know, in terms of, you know, the records that are available. And so when you look at, look at the Bicentennial 1935, it, you know, it, 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 you know, it made a profit on the pageant, and you know it, you know, by most accounts, I think the, the people at the time felt it was a success. The town had marked itself, and you know things had come, had worked out pretty well. Now, and to kind of make one final note on that, I want to read the following editorial here for me. When one considers the money spent during the during the five day celebration, they might have been counting the American Legion. Um, one can estimate the profits in thousands of dollars. This money brought to St. Genevieve will ultimately benefit everyone here. Added to this, St. Genevieve has received thousands of dollars worth of publicity of a nature beneficial to the community, which, which, which has given the distinction of being an outstanding tourism city in Missouri. The fact that the Bicentennial is over will not keep thousands of historically minded tourists from visiting here in the future. The Bicentennial has built upon this foundation now is up to now the foundation is up to us to preserve. I think that's the key thing. We've had a successful event. Now, how do we build upon it? How do we get how do we get people to keep coming here interested in St. Jim? Well, one thing that, that's going to help is the following. After Bicentennial and still in the nineteen thirties, Charles E. Peterson, the man who previously had founded Habs, he came here in 1938 to basically do a, 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 a study of St. Genevieve's architecture for the William Clark Society. And you know, when he came here, he you know, spent, spent the, you know, the year 1938 looking at the buildings of St. Genevieve. And as a result, in 1939, he published this, the guy to St. Genevieve, what notes on his architecture. And you know what you have here with this document is one of the first times you have someone who is who a scholarly and an architectural architect who comes in and is saying, okay, th what is special or historically significant about these buildings? And you know this is one of the first things that the town knew the buildings were were, were old, people didn't live there, but now we have you know someone saying these things. These structures are important. Um, in terms of Peterson, what he did is he basically examined 24 structures from the Beckett Revolt House all the way to the old academy, you know, right by um, the school district that I teach at. And in terms of you know what he was looking at, you know, he, you know several things. He you know, he he, made, he looked at basically number one. These buildings are significant, okay? These buildings are important. And he identified um, several key architectural things which made these buildings um, special. For example, you know, people that knew that some of this was French colonial architecture, but with Peterson, he talks in detail about, and pardon my French here, is it the Fauteuil L. Carrier, is that right? Okay, the Fauteuil L. Carrier, um, close to the ground. And also he mentions you know, the floor, so, so, so okay. And, and for example, with the cut back of the house, which for second was at last night, he really gives you know detail about why that bit, why that structure is important and and what is special about it that he has not found mm -hmm. with you know with his Habs teams almost anywhere else in the United States. And so, you know, this study eventually would be published in the Missouri Historical Review in 1941. The major difference, because here's the, here's the copy of it, the Missouri Historical Review, is included pictures, which the first edition, which I was able to get through the Kent Library at Encino, in terms of photocopy, the, the 1941 edition did not have that. And plus, he added a little bit more background in terms of research. But you have one of the first times, you know, scholarly analysis of what makes these buildings special. And one key thing before we move on with this is he identifies what they are, and then also he makes, makes issues that we all know here today, these buildings need to be preserved or restored. And because they are special, so now you have this 
happening in the Long. So Peterson's work came out in June 1939. At the same time, Charles Ravenswell, who had, you know, previous couple summers worked at worked the packs in terms of you know summer job, he um, he had gone back to Greenville, Missouri, where he was from, and then he had gotten hired to basically make the to, to by the Missouri Historical Society, which he later became president of, and had a long distinguished career with them. He was he was given the task of making of trying to produce the WPA guide to the Shoney State, whereas Habs was to, um, to, to employ unemployed unemployed architects and surveyors. The WPA guide, which will fun, well, at the time was to employ unemployed writers, make travel guides that would basically look at the major landmarks and places to visit within the states of our country. And for the skeleton crew, starting in 1938, Peterson, I'm sorry, Ravensway, he was able to publish um, the Missouri WPI to, to the guide to Showing State. St. Jimmy's section of the guide um, would be 12 pages. And what you have here is you have, you know, basically detailed map of of, of 18, you know, Peterson did 24. Ravens would identify 18 places. We're using a lot of what Peterson used in terms of scholarly. Now you have, if you're going to drive there or walk around and see the structures, here is, you know, the, these places you can visit. And for example, on this, here's what he said <coughs> on the, the Senator Lynn Hacks in this guy. Senator Lynn Hacks, private. Merchant Street, west of South Street, is a two-story frame white house set on the edge of the sidewalk. The house is said to have been built by Dr. Lynn in 1827, four years before he became senator, with its small, many painted windows and roof lines suggesting the, the New England salt box type of house. The structure is representative of those built by many of the first settlers in St. Jimmy. The side entrance opens at, upon a garden containing many fine examples of boxwood. So, Walk by the Berlin house and these others, you know, as you can see in the photograph from this right here, he's giving a description of what these places like. You have a guidebook in terms of what you can see. And for me, when I did my research, this was something that I hadn't found a lot of mention of was in terms of the WP the guide, especially when I first started looking at the secondary sources. And so, you know, in terms of this one, this one definitely, you know. In terms of tourist guide. And the National Park would later on, at the same time in, in the early 40s, had a, a, a walking guide as well, which is very similar based on this right here. So you, 1930s, you've got the bicentennial, and then you've got the work from these two individuals right here that, you know, is development of tourism historically is, is, is happening. World War II seems to have slowed down momentum created in the, in the 30s. Okay? Obviously, roads are improving, but you know, one, th one thing you start to see is you know, with the advent of the war, I mean, things you know, life would you know, be not the same until the war was over. And so, after the war ended, you, know, you see what occurred with what I see as the final phase in terms of the development of historical tourism prior to the 1960s. You had the involvement of Bicentennial. You had Peterson, Wadensley, and the Conference of David. Now you start to see the movement of towards let's restore and preserve these historical structures that have been identified by experts like Peterson, and now that people, concerned individuals in the community know about it. And one of the best examples is the example of the story of the Bold Duke House. Um, Charles Wadensley was president of the Missouri Historical Society. And in 1947, he was concerned about the state of the Gold Duke House. It had gone on sale in that year. And you know, here's an example a picture of the Habs photograph of the Gold Duke House in the state of curation. He was concerned that you know, whoever was going to buy the house might destroy the house and we'd lose this valuable structure. So in, so in 1948 in St. Louis, um, Ravensway you know, gave a lecture, and he talked about you know, the need to restore homes, um, you know, homes at the time, and he included the whole house in his speech. And 
in, and in, in that meeting were some members of the Clone of Danes of America. And eventually, the Clone of Danes of America, um, made one of the prominent ones was Constantine Matthews, um, who's the husband of Harry Matthews, who was president of the Civil Alliance at the time, huge, important person <coughs> St. Jenny. They decided to purchase the house. Now, Ravensway, prior to the lecture, had you know, tried to you know, find people who were willing to buy a house to basically save it. And then the Colonial Danes in 1949, they stepped up and, and bought the house. Um, in terms of the preservation, okay, preservation was slow, which leading into the 1950s, Ravensway eventually was able to recruit enough of a third and a very important outside expert, Dr. Ernest Allen Conley. Dr. Conley, who in 1956 was at was architect at professor um, at Washington University, he was recruited by Ravensway to basically restore in and and, and restore the whole new house. Um, the previous architect there had saying things had not gone like they wanted to, and so Dr. Conley basically came in and re restored the house. And in terms of you know this restoration, okay, it um, this this and with other homes as well, you start. To, this is what you start to see in terms of let's restore to these homes and let's make these into you know and as in this case a house museum where people can come see and visit. So you know how do we get people here? You know, market you know historical tourism, and now we have places like this where one can go and visit and see it, okay? So the grand opening was in October of 1957, and then spring of 1958 was when this home was, was opened in the spring for tours. There it is, right there. So, so to conclude here, by the 1960s, by the 1960s, um, you know, Tourism, as we see today, historical tourism began to take off. You know, other homes were, had been restored or started to be restored, um, you know, like the Bull Duke House had. Um, in the 60s, you had, you know, the, the forming of the St. Genevieve Tourism Mission, the master plan for St. Genevieve Restoration 1966, which Mr. Francois, Francois um, you know, you know, was part of also Charles Peterson was an advisor on that study was going on. So by the 1960s, you have you know, St. Genevieve as it is today, historical recognition that continued in the decades to come, and you can see a celebration of its French colonial past. And the foundations were laid in you know 19 the critical decade of the 1930s and then 40s, and then restorations late 40s, early 50s. Which, which leads me to conclude here in terms of in terms of St. Jim. Um, Gary Francois said in 1967 that St. Genevieve is basically special. And you know, and I agree with him. You have a place that has buildings that are historically significant. There are, you know, there's, there's three buildings that we have in this town that you will that you can't hardly find anywhere else. And you know and there's a rich culture here that you just won't find, you know, not being being an outsider myself anywhere else. And you know, and that tourism endures to to this day. And as we see here, it's strong. And the foundations were laid, um, you know, in these critical points at the early in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and thank you very much, and happy to have you. Channel 7 and 98 TV and web broadcasting 
are made possible through contributions and donations from viewers like you. Thank you for your support. Thank you.